one of my closest students and uh, someone who's been a dear friend, a dear spiritual friend this lifetime, Malin is her name. She has been uh, practicing with the experience of having breast cancer. She, she, unfortunately, when she discovered that she had cancer, it was already stage three. She did have chemotherapy and radiation, which slowed the growth, but it didn't stop it. And uh, it did spread and it went into the lungs. And uh, she, just, she just found that out. I guess it was the 10th. Yeah, the 10th of last month when she had a scan and she went to the doctor. And... No, she found out on the 11th because I actually saw her on the 10th. I saw her on the 10th of June. And she told me that I remember she, she came to our Katina. She is. She'd been keeping to herself because chemotherapy and radiation does challenge the immune system. So she'd be keeping to herself a lot, but she was able to come. And these are her good Dhamma sisters, Joyce, Jin, and Anne. She was able to come. And uh, she told me at that time that the cancer wasn't eradicated, but she felt she had four or five years. That was in October. But one of the things I noticed is that she if she was tearing up quite often and weeping and um, seemed extra sensitive. And I, I think in hindsight that she knew she was dying and she didn't want to tell us that she didn't want other people to be sad. And I think that in these pictures, she was aware that this was her last time coming to Anandagiri. And uh, a little bit of background. Uh, years ago, I met Malin when I was eight punces, so that's 19 years ago, nearly 20 years ago. I became a little closer to her when I became an abbot at Wat Nanachat's branch monastery called Pu Jom Gom, where she became, I guess, my first lay supporter. I'd been a bhikkhu for 10 years, and she became my first, uh, somebody who said, if there's anything you need, Ajahn, to support your practice or for the monastery, let me know. And uh, it's, that's called giving Pawarana giving permission to ask for things if you need. And so when people meet a monk or a nun that they feel they can trust, they give them that, that permission. And uh, so she became a supporter of the monastery and a supporter of mine. And then that was an experiment. I was at the, an abbot of that monastery for a year and I decided to then go and try Australia. And uh, I guess what I'd seen as a young monk was Ajahn Samedo came to Thailand for a period of time and ended up in the Western country and Ajahn Pasano did a similar thing. And uh, so I thought I should try that. And uh, she asked me, why would you ever consider being a full-time abbot in Thailand, Ajahn? And I said, no. And she said, why not? I said, there's things about Thai people that I just don't understand. And uh, I would find it really frustrating living in a place where I just don't understand what's going on. And she said, what do you mean? Well, I said, for example, like Australians in general are straight talking. You, you know what they feel about things. And if there's a problem, they just talk it through. Sometimes it can get a bit emotional. People might, you know, get it off their chest, have it out. But then also they kind of forgive. And at least you know what people think. There's a kind of a straightforwardness and a frankness. And uh, I appreciate that. I people have this idea of, Expressing emotions means you, you lose face. And it's an, a kind of an Asian concept. And uh, so sometimes it can be the case that you know someone's upset with you, but they don't come and tell you why. And, uh, and then if you ask them, I know you're upset with me. Do you want to talk about it? Then they actually get more upset with you because you asking them why they're upset made them lose face. And so, and they'll also like, there's a lot of, pressure on Thai people to be kind of smiley and friendly. I mean, every, every culture has its positive side and its shadow side. I mean, generally Thai people are kind and generous and loving. There's a lot of warmth and love in Thai culture. I guess the shadow side of that is people feel that they have to present that kind of a appearance. And, uh, and if they don't, they lose face. And so if you ask them what's up, then they dislike you more and get more upset with you. And also this, this thing about not, not talking things through, 
they can hold a grudge for many years and you never even know what they got upset about. So that's the kind of thing I said to her. I just, I just don't want to have to live with that being like a serious part of my life because I grew up in Australia and I just, I like to be able to know what's up and uh, I like to be straightforward in my dealings in the world. So of course I went back to Australia and I remembered that I never felt particularly at home there even when I was a little boy, how much more so after living in Asia for 10 years. And I'm like, you know what, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> I guess I, I think I'm going to have to try Thailand. So I came back and I said to her, look, uh, as, as my closest supporter, my, my, my most loyal supporter in Thailand, I said to her, look, I, I could possibly do something in Thailand, but I'm going to need help. So when I was invited to come and look at the land of the monastery I, I now live in, Anandikiri in Pechabun, uh, I liked it. And, but I didn't have disciples in this area. I, I had students in Ubon, Northeast Thailand, and I have students in Bangkok. But Pechabun is Northern Thailand, the bottom part of Northern Thailand. And I didn't have any students here. And I said to her, look, if I'm gonna do this, build a monastery from scratch, I'm gonna need a serious, serious help. And uh, she said, okay, I'll help you. And so we, we had this working relationship where, uh, you know, particularly the first three years, Malin would sit on a bus coming from Ubon Rachasani to Khao Kho, where I, where I live. It would take 12 hours. She used to have to change the bus. And she would do that once a month. Malin worked Saturday and Sunday teaching English to Thai children. So she, was, uh, she had quite a bit of spare time. But still, at the age of 50, sitting on a bus for 12 hours all the way here, all the way back, once a month. She did that for about three years. And um, so it was enormously helpful. And it, it's a very interesting relationship, this uh, lay, close lay supporter. It's a very interesting relationship. And uh, with, with her and I, it was very wholesome. Uh, kind of, it's, it's almost like a, a pure type of love. One of the ways that love can manifest in the world, which is really quite altruistic and, and wholesome, mutually beneficial. So she... What, and she managed to do it very skillfully. Like, in many respects, she was my student. She did ask Dharma questions. I gave, and uh, but at other times, because she was about fourteen years older, at other times when I was struggling a bit, she knew how to be like a big sister or an auntie. And uh, it was this interesting kind of delicate dance. I was like, okay, she's my student. She's my supporter. When she sees I'm struggling a bit. She's my big sister. And uh, it was just, uh, I guess these kind of karmic relationships probably have causes in the past. Why is, there, why is there that feeling of trusting one another? Why is there a feeling of being willing to make some kind of commitment to help one another? And so one of the things that she did do in the first few years of Anandagiri, because I, you don't learn all of the skills of, of how to be a, a functioning abbot although you don't have those skills straight away. It's, it's, and people don't teach us, you don't become a monk and enroll in a course of business management. You know, it's not, it's a, uh, and then all of a sudden you become an abbot and there's like accounts, accounting, building projects, bills, expenses, things that need to be paid. And so, and then there's also this pressure that you don't owe us for too much. So then there's this quite delicate balance of there's bills to pay. There's these people who've been, who've expressed an interest to help but I can't ask for too much. And so what would happen is <laughs> I would ask for not quite enough. A project would be almost finished, but there wasn't enough money. And I wouldn't want to ask the person who was the sponsor because I didn't want to appear greedy. So what do you do? And that's where Malin and another lady, uh, Yom Dao in Bangkok, in those first few years were particularly helpful because they would mention to their friends, Ajahn Achalo at Anandagiri Monastery is building a kuti. Would you like to help finish the bathroom? And it might be just like 10,000 baht here, or, you know, so 5,000 baht here, 10,000 baht there. But literally every project I did, there wasn't quite enough money for it. And Malin would like raise the money among her Dharma friends and Dharma practitioners. And I think there was probably a point at about the three year point where her saw her car to run away because it's like, oh no, here she comes. She's gonna, she's gonna mention the opportunity to make merit at an, at an undergiri again. <laughs> and uh, 
But after three years, after three years, uh, I don't know why exactly, but after three years, we just received a lot more support and uh, we never needed, we didn't really need that kind of someone going into bat and really making it their personal kind of project to, to get us over the finish line of various various projects. But as you can understand, I'm deeply appreciative of the fact that she made that commitment and she made those efforts and she kept checking in and she made sure the bills were paid and the projects were completed and that I felt supported enough to stay. And then, you know, for another, after that, she continued to help in various ways, but she, she didn't come once a month. It might be every couple of months, a few times a year. But uh, another thing Melinda did was she offered my phone credit once a month for 10 years. So every phone call I've been able to make and uh, this lady made that possible, returning the calls and all these things. So one just notices that, uh, yeah, we helped each other. And from, from her part, like there were times I was saying, like she could be like a big sister at times. So when I was invited to teach a retreat in Malaysia from uh, Brother Teo's group and Aunt Joyce attended that retreat, I remember saying to Malin, I've never taught a full retreat before. I'm nervous. I don't know if I can do it. You have to come. She's like, okay. You know, it's like, it's just, it's just something about having someone that you know well in the room helps you feel more confident about doing it. And she willingly did that. Similarly, it's my first pilgrimage, leading a pilgrimage by myself in India. I need someone who I really know. Can you come? Yes, okay, I'll come. And uh, we just have many of those shared experiences where she, and, you know, if, if I was fine and I didn't need much help, she'd sit in the back and she'd meditate and she, there's no issues. But if I, did, if I did have something I needed to consult with, I had a good friend that I could depend upon to kind of consult with. And so, yeah, so it was a very interesting relationship. It was friend, sister, and student, and benefactor. And uh, she did pass away. And uh, I, I saw her on the 10th, of June, she told me that she thinks she's going to live for another year. She was sitting on the floor talking, just like you see in the picture now. Melinda's the one, this one here, on the, with the scarf. She was, uh, she sat on the floor for an hour, made some offerings, had a chat, chanted a blessing. She told me she thinks she has a year, but I noticed that she had a lot of pain walking, like the nerves were hurting, and, and she's. I noticed that she needed to get someone else to open her front gate, and I'm thinking. If she can't even walk to 20 meters to the front gate, and if she can't take a few steps without it hurting, I just had my suspicions. So I called her younger sister and I asked her younger sister. And uh, her younger sister said, Well, her doctor says she has one month. And then, uh, and then this is very much like her. She didn't want people to feel sorry for her and she didn't want people to feel sad. So she was probably putting on a bit of a performance like, Yeah, I'll be around for a bit longer. But the fact was, she, she knew the cancer had spread and she knew she didn't have long. So one of the things I was doing in, in, in terms of one of the things I wanted to mention in this sharing is like how we practice with grief. When the Buddha, when the Buddha passed into Mahaparinibbana, it is said that only the Arahants and the Anagamis didn't cry. Even the stream enterers and the, and the once returners, they cried. Why? Because they loved him very deeply. And Lord Buddha explains that where there is love, there is also suffering. And so when people were parted from their teacher, anybody who knew the Buddha and loved the Buddha who wasn't an Arahant or an Anagami wept. And a lot of people have the experience when they go to Kusinara, the holy site where Lord Buddha passed into Mahaparinibbana, that they feel sadness. It's like there's still a kind of a sadness in the air. Many people have that experience there. And... Um, the first time I went to Kusinara, I had that experience. I studied the Buddha's life and the Buddha's teachings more deeply. And the one statement that he, ma he makes is that the Buddha has attained to the deathless. Another statement that he makes is he, who he sees, who he sees Dhamma sees the Buddha. So the subsequent times that I went to Kusinara, I had this determination. I am going to see the Buddha. He didn't, he attained to the deathless. He didn't go anywhere. And um, I wasn't as affected by sadness when I had that attitude. And I did have some very peaceful meditations in the Vihara at the site of the Mahaparinibbana. So yes, there is a, 
there's some sadness that uh, that my auntie, we used to call her Auntie Malin, and uh, has passed away. But when when I was in Bodh Gaya after my meditation in the Shwedikon Pagoda in Burma, after each of my four meditations, I would dedicate merit to her. When we offered these butter lamps, I offered merit to her, and uh, when we offered flowers, etc. Another thing that's very interesting about Malin's passing is she received tremendous support on many levels in her death and dying process. And it's kind of worthy of mentioning because it's a teaching in itself. Malin was not an especially wealthy person, but she gave consistently what she could give for a period of decades. So it's like this drip, 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 drip. Another thing that, another level of generosity that Malin had was, as I mentioned earlier, giving up of her time, making effort. So coming to an Andagiri once a month for three years, 12 hours on the bus there, 12 hours on the bus there, back and uh, raising funds, helping to pay the bills, checking in what is needed and uh, trying to help fill the holes, fill in the blanks. And, um, and she did that for another monastery in Ubon, in Ubon as well, my good friend Ajahn Pum, which is where her funeral is currently happening. And I'll be attending the last, Thais do funerals for three days in general. I'll be attending the third day tomorrow. I'll be traveling to attend the funeral. So, But what I noticed was she lives next to a hospital. She didn't have to be admitted to hospital. Palliative care agreed to pop in and see her in her bedroom each day. Her best friend, came and lived with her. I asked, once I realized she had a month left, I asked if I, if I could arrange the payment of a full-time live-in carer. And I did arrange that payment. So she had a, she had a full-time live-in carer. She had her best friend. She had her young, younger sister who lives next door. She had palliative care popping in once a day. And um, she was able to pass away in her bedroom, surrounded by friends and I, I popped in, I saw her, I guess, two days before she died. I popped in, we spent two hours together. And another day I spent two hours together. And uh, she, she had had one day where she was, didn't wake up all day, didn't drink anything all day. And that normally means that the person is close to death. When she did wake up, she asked, where is Ajahn Achalo? And her sister said, Ajahn Ajahn has got back from Burma. He made offerings for you. He's coming up to see you in two days. At which point she said, I want a, I want a glass of Coke. Or can you make me a hot coffee? And then she, she also asked for a, like a soft boiled egg. And she kind of took in some nutriment and willed herself to kind of live for a few more days. And so we were able to say, we were able to say thank you. And uh, I thanked her for being a good big sister, a good auntie, and a good committee member. She was the first member of the official committee, committee for my monastery. And she said, you know, she was weeping. I was weeping. <laughs> and uh, Jintana was there wiping her tears. and uh, I was wiping my own tears. But it was a very interesting experience because I think Buddhists were very lucky because nobody fell into, although it's a sad occasion, nobody fell into a kind of a deep sorrow. Nobody really fell into sadness. It was just a, a flowing of natural grief. Separation from the loved is painful. But we were focusing on the fact that we wished her well and we wanted her to have a peaceful death and we wanted her to go to a good place. So we would just wipe the tears and continue the conversation. So I said, thank you for being a good sister. Thank you for being a good auntie. Thank you for being a good committee member. And she said, and she said, thank you for being a good monk. <laughs> thank you for being a good teacher. Thank you for being a good abbot. And uh, she also offered her last set of three robes on the next day to me. And uh, I chanted a blessing. And then I had a feeling that I should leave because she would probably hang around a bit longer if I, and it was obviously time to go. So I had, my intuition was, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was willing to meditate next to her bed as she died. But my intuition was that I should actually leave because then she would feel more comfortable about dying. 
But I told her sister, call me when her breathing changes and her when she stops speaking and stops and her breathing changes, I want you to call me there. And uh, so as it happened, Ajahn Siri Ponyo was on his way to the airport, good friend of mine, and he chanted by, by her bedside. This is another thing I wanted to mention what I was talking about, the supports that Malin received was, uh, yes, was Ajahn Sri Panyo chanting by her bedside. She, she had monks popping in to chant and meditate next to her like, almost every day. And uh, I did it myself on three occasions. And uh, once he called me and said, She's, it doesn't look like she has long now. From, from what I've heard, one of the last things to go in the dying process is a sense of hearing. So a person, a person may have closed eyes and may not be able to speak, but oftentimes they can still hear. And so I told her, I know her very well, and I know the things, I know the merits that she's made. And I told her, Malin, I want you to remember now the 17 times that you went on pilgrimage to India. I want you to recollect the fact that you did scores of meditation retreats. I want you to recollect the fact that you helped to establish two monasteries. Think about the fact that you kept five precepts strictly for 30 years, eight precepts strictly every one prayer. You've paid respects to arahants, to bodhisattvas, to holy sites. And I said, now I want you to take your merit happily. And if Dave has come to take you to your next birth, just go. Don't worry about us. We're okay. Now is the time to worry about yourself. So my, my other student slash friend, Francois, a Frenchman, good friend of Malin's, he's holding the phone to her ear. And I'm saying this to her, Malin, you can go now. If the Dave has come to take you, go. So when I got off the phone, I called a teacher I know who has special abilities. And before he, I even answered the question, he said, she's gone to a good place, you know, she's already a deva. I said, well, when did that happen? He said, well, I said, I said, just now I was telling her if the devas come to take you to your next birth, go. And he says, well, she heard you and she did. And I said, well, which, which level of heaven? And he said, Tushita heaven. Tushita heaven is like four heavens up. It's the place where the bodhisattvas reside before they take their final, final birth. So that's where Gautama Buddha was as a bodhisattva in the life before he became a Buddha. So I was very happy for Malin that, uh, that she could accomplish that. And uh, another thing that I, I thought I'd mention was uh, there were people offering things for Malin in holy sites around the world. I think there's a picture of the um, offerings in Sri Lanka. There was, uh, I was making offerings in Burma. That's actually her, her funeral now. That's not, a, that looks like a holy site, but that's, that's her coffin. And, so this is the uh, oldest known Bodhi tree, closest relative to the Bodhi tree in, in Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. And Mr. Prabhat made these flower offerings on behalf of Malin, dedicated the merit to her. Another friend in Bogaya, Michi Anita, made offerings in Bogaya. And uh, another student made offerings in Chiang Mai. So even before she was dead, this was at the uh, Ruanwili Seya Chedi, my other one, another of my favorite Chedis in Anuradhapura. So it's very interesting that what I was going to talk about, another quality of Malin was if people wanted to come to Ubon where she lived and pay respects to Wat Manachat or Ajahn Bum's monastery, she would pick them up at the airport, let them stay at her place, drive them to that place. So whenever, if people wanted to offer robes to the monks, but they didn't know how to get them, for example, Malaysian students, she would get the robe and they would give her the money. Like when, when people wanted to make merit or do auspicious things, she was often there kind of enabling them and supporting them. And she just did that constantly. So it was just very interesting to see that. And um, I won't mention names, but some of my supporters in Bangkok are millionaires and uh, <clears throat> millionaires who own big companies who are very busy with their meetings. Like I tell you what, rich people have suffering. Self-made rich people have a lot of meetings to attend to, in my experience. They don't, they don't have the wealth of spare time. But two of these people made the effort to come and be by Malin's side, as did Auntie Joyce, coming from another country. 
And uh, there was the second day I saw Melina, she actually had a fever, some kind of an infection. And there was this millionaire is like wiping her body and putting ice packs on her. And it's just like, yeah, just as a, I don't need any, re, I don't need any more, uh, I don't need my belief in karma to be bolstered. I, I have total belief in good acts bring good results, harmful acts bring painful results. I get that. I have absolute faith in that. But at the same time, it is wonderful to see, like Malin was not a wealthy person. She was a, of ordinary means, but she was very generous of heart. And what's the result of that? After decades, we literally has, she has a millionaires coming to wipe down her body and give her a hug and uh, say, thank you. So she wasn't perfect, you know, when she left, I'm kind of thinking all the things I'm grateful for. And then there's also that awareness of there's that one time she said that really nasty thing, you know, <laughs> because human beings aren't David's, right? They have their moments. And, um, and I was also reflecting on that, like the, the necessity and the wonderfulness of being able to forgive. Because if I, if I hadn't been able to forgive that, if I held a grudge for that one time she said that really mean thing, we wouldn't have had that beautiful sense of closure and I wouldn't have been able to help her to die and to be reborn in a nice place in a nice way. And I was just kind of thinking, yeah, this forgiveness practice is really important because, you know, there was, when she said that nasty thing, she'd done so many good things, I could easily forgive it. So, okay, she said something really nasty once, I'm going to forgive her. And I'm so glad I did because uh, it was just really wonderful to have that beautiful sense of closure and to witness the way the way she had a beautiful death so uh, tomorrow i will attend the uh, last day of the funeral and the day after that they will burn the body so i just wanted to share a little bit contemplation of impermanence and contemplation of death is a, a major buddhist practice as many of you will know and also just wanted to give an example of one of the forms of altruistic and wholesome love that exists in the world. And uh, yeah, monks also have feelings. Monks also have relationships. We have to, we have to navigate 227 rules, but we do have those people we care for deeply and those who care for us. And uh, she was an important person in my life. And I'm very happy that uh, she lived a good life and, got a good result. So Tushita heaven is praised as a place to be reborn in because the devas, Tushita means contented. Tushita is the heaven of the contented. Dawatimsa heaven is a, what is in the sensual realm. So if you get born in a lower heaven, you will experience more refined sensuality than on the earth, but you will burn up a lot of merit and it will be difficult to focus on Dharma practice because the tastes are better, the sights are better, the sounds are better. We're already challenged with sensuality in this world, but it's everything's nicer there. So it's even harder to focus on actual practice. But Tushita heaven is apparently correlates with Upajara Samadhi as a Samadhi experience. That's like neighborhood concentration, almost absorption, touching on absorption. So the devas then naturally have cool minds and they're experiencing a sense of fullness, which is coming from the contentedness of their mind. And they can, if you have some experience of, of uh, samadhi before you got born as that deva, apparently the devas in Tushita heaven can also practice meditation. They can practice their jhanas. And in doing so, it's a heaven realm where you can actually increase your merits. You don't burn up your merits, you actually increase your merits. So in terms of heaven realms that the master Buddhist practitioners recommend, that's the one. Because apparently if you go to Brahma realms, if you get amazing samadhi and you go to a Brahma realm, the chance of getting intoxicated and deluded by your own radiance, actually developing more conceit because of the beauty and the radiance of your mind. But if you go to Tushita, you'll be seeing all these other beings, many of, many of whom have more virtues than you, more radiance than you, more good qualities than you. So that helps you stay humble. And also you can practice meditation. Another thing that's, that's said about Tushita heaven, which is apparently quite unique, is that Tushita Devas can choose their time and place of rebirth. It's just something about that realm that they have that, uh, they have that as a possibility. I mean, that word gets 
mentioned reincarnation. And some people think reincarnation is part of the Buddha's teachings. Lord Buddha teaches rebirth. Most people do not have the mental ability to choose their rebirth. So we're kind of bound by karma and karma takes us where it's taking us. We can make determinations before we die that will help to some degree, kind of rebirth we want. But in those moments, there's not, usually not that much control. But the beings in Tushita heaven, they actually can reincarnate. That's uh, one of the specific advantages of being reborn in that realm. So Malina is in a situation now, I believe, where she can meditate, increase her merits, and choose a rebirth at the appropriate time where she can continue on her path to enlightenment. So it's a story with a happy ending. And uh, I hope... I hope someone helps me to die as much as people helped her to die. <laughs> There's a little bit of envy, but mostly I'm happy for her. So I offer this for your reflection. I hope something that I said may have been helpful to you. May you be supported in your practice. May you also be generous, understanding that uh, whatever generosity you can practice materially or with your time, with your talents, that will come back to support you when you need it. And it's a foundation for samadhi and insight. Lord Buddha said, if you knew what I knew about generosity, you would not eat one single meal without sharing some of it. So uh, I can see from Malin's life, the way so many positive and helpful forces rallied around her in her time of need, that the benefits of dana are immense. So let's all continue to be generous. And I offer these reflections. I hope something is helpful. I did a good job holding back the tears, didn't I? I bet some of you wept a few tears. Yeah. Holy water. <laughs> Through the goodness that arises from my practice, May my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world, may the highest gods and evil forces, celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of death, May those who are friendly, indifferent, or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of my life. May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless through the goodness that arises from my practice and through this act of sharing. May all desires and attachments quickly cease and all harmful states of mind until I realize Nibbana in every kind of birth. May I have an upright mind with mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. May the forces of delusion not take hold, nor weaken my resolve. The Buddha is my excellent refuge. Unsurpassed is the protection of the Dhamma. The solitary Buddha is my noble Lord. The Sangha is my supreme support. Through the supreme power of all these, may darkness and delusion be dispelled. So this was Malin offering a robe to a monk for the last time. No. This is Malin when she was a young lady, 24 years old. So this is when she's passed away and uh, this lady's a beautician and she actually came and put lipstick and uh, makeup and made sure she had a nice looking corpse. <laughs> but it's just like, you know, it's just amazing, you know, like the, the way people wanted to support her. And uh, this was one of her dear friends. They would often go to the monastery together. And this lady came on a pilgrimage with me and Anne Malin in Nepal many years ago, 15 years ago. And this is an, actually an asking forgiveness ceremony. 
So actually her consciousness is already gone, but her dear friends, nearest and dearest, are asking forgiveness if they've done anything wrong and uh, giving her and, and forgiving her and giving her their, ble their blessing to move on to an auspicious birth. So it's just such a, you know, there's one of the things that Thai culture does quite well is uh, particularly in the rural, rural Thailand, less so in Bangkok, but in rural Thailand, people have a really healthy relationship to dying and uh, making merit after the death. Oftentimes people die at home, surrounded by their loved ones. And, uh, then the monks come and chant in their home for three days afterwards. So rest in peace, Mulin. Enjoy your lotus birth. Think of us sometimes. <laughs> Sprinkle some petals on us occasionally. Okay. Good night, everybody. <laughs>